okay, I'm very pleased um, uh, about today's session and I'm very pleased that it's all women um, presenting the session. This is about the um, something I don't know much about at all. In fact, it was only uh, Anne who uh, sort of introduced me to it, which is the Communist Women's Movement, which was set up in the, in the early 20s um, as an international women's movement, um, came out of Comintern, and um, tried to, uh, um, you know, cohere the revolutionary women across across the world into a movement and um, formulate demands for this movement, etc. It didn't last very long, unfortunately, and there were various reasons for it. And I'm sure we'll be looking into some of these reasons today. Um, I'm very pleased to be joined by Daria Diakonova. Uh, Konova. <laughs> so she's a Marxist and a communist, and uh, studies the communism and Marxism historian. She's uh, completing a PhD on the international ties of the Young Communist League of Canada during the interwar pure, uh, period at the University of Montreal. Sorry. Um, and later on, we will be he hearing from Anne McShane, who's looking at emancipation and the women of the East. So there's two aspects of um, the, the communist women's movement in the early 1920s. Both uh, comrades are studying the issue, as I said, and um, have different um, pinpointing different issues that they are particularly studying, etc. It's a fascinating uh, issue that, I th as I said, and I think it's very educational for most of our audience. So we're starting, I believe, with Daria, is that right? Yeah. Daria will be giving an intro of about 25, perhaps 30 minutes, or see how long you can, <laughs> how you can go on. It's, thank you very much. Great. Thanks a lot um, for inviting me uh, to participate in this um, webinar. Uh, so this project is um, uh, the presentation which I'm going um, to do today uh, is based on the research that uh, I have done, we have done uh, for an edited collection of documents uh, with my co-editor Mike Taber and uh, also um, John Riddle in our team as an, as an advisor. Uh, so the book is on the International Communist Women's Movement in the early 20s and it's going to be published by Brill, uh, Historical Materialism Book Series, uh, hopefully um, sometime this year or early next year. Uh, so the book is uh, a collection of documents, many of them archival documents from uh, Moscow Comintern uh, archives, which uh, have never been published before. So the uh, objective of the, um, this collection is to recover the experiences uh, of these communist women uh, that so far remain unknown. Um, so, so what is the uh, communist women's movement? The name itself was not an official name, but this is how communist women referred to themselves. Uh, and this movement was founded by communist women's leaders. Uh, and it was integrated into the Comintern and communist parties around the world. Um, the movement had its first conference uh, in July 1920 in Moscow. So this idea of the necessity of involving women into the communist movement and of setting up international structures for working on women was at that time voiced by many communist leaders, men, both men and women. The Russian Bolshevik Revolution brought about recognition of women as equal to men under law in 1918. The first all-Russian Congress of Working Women was also held in 1918 in Soviet Russia and resolved upon the creation of the Women's Department of the Russian Communist Party, the, the, uh, what is um, usually referred to as the General Women's Department. In 1919 to 1920, the General Del, in cooperation with the party, worked out a series of measures adopted as laws which advanced women's emancipation in a revolutionary way, turning the Soviet Union into a champion of promoting women's rights. So communist women around the world were inspired by this Soviet example and decided to unite forces to fight for women's rights within the framework of the nascent Communist International. Uh, actually, the Communist International was born just one year, ago, one year before, 
in uh, March 1919. Uh, and it's at its uh, um, foundational co uh, Congress, uh, it adopted a resolution uh, drafted by Alexander Kontai on the need to draw women workers into the struggle for socialism. And then next year, in the summer of uh, 1920, the International Organization was set up, uh, as I said in this time. So uh, I will speak mostly um, today about uh, this first conference uh, and the program which communist women developed at this conference, and tackle in particular uh, four points. Uh, first of all, uh, the relationship between um, the anti-capitalist struggle and women's emancipation. Uh, secondly, the relationship between uh, communist women and bourgeois feminists. Uh, I will also speak about the question of motherhood and reproductive rights uh, and about the, um, the housework issue and the division um, of labor in uh, private sphere. Aria, just a second. Um, I think there's something a little bit wrong with your microphone. It's quite, oh. quite a sort of background noise. I oh. wonder, if you, is it an external one? Could you put it a bit closer to you, perhaps? Maybe, maybe I'll just put the headphones. Maybe it's... Does that work? I'm not sure. Because sometimes it... There's a, whenever you talk, it's kind of a background noise coming from it. Oh. Try to... Okay, uh, let me... No, I can't. No, no, we can't hear you at all. <laughs> Sorry. She hasn't said anything. No, she's trying to. No? You no, don't yeah. hear it all? No, that works much better. Great. Yes. Yeah, that it's works. better? That's much okay, better. Should, I, should I continue this way? Yeah. Yes, that's yes. better. Thank okay. You. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and I would also like to speak uh, about some transnational aspects of the communist women's movement's work, and namely uh, the efforts of communist women among what they call the women of the East. Uh, okay, so um, let me go to my first point, uh, the relationship between women's emancipation and the anti-capitalist fight. So at the beginning of their conference, their first conference, communist women discussed the manifesto to the working women of the world, which featured the key points that the conference would later elaborate in its thesis or guidelines. Uh, stating that working women were the most, quote, most oppressed sections of working humanity who suffered not less than men because of the imperialist war and the economic dislocation it had brought about, the manifesto singled out the existence of capitalism as the major factor of women's oppression. Communists thus linked the emancipation of women to the anti-capitalist fight. The manifesto insisted that women suffered from double sla slavery, as many communists, uh, Lenin, Lenin among others, pointed out, at work and in their homes. So this idea uh, of the interdependence between women's liberation and the elimination of capitalism was also, also present in the first conference's thesis, uh, which were drafted by Clara Zetkin, amended by Ines Armand, and published eventually as the guidelines for the communist women's movement. Um, <clears throat> so um, if we look at the um, relationship between uh, communist women and other women's rights movements, uh, and in particular feminists um, of the time, um, one would see that throughout the 20s, communist women, and before that, uh, communist women tried to distance themselves from what they defined as bourgeois feminism, that is mainstream liberal first wave feminists. Communist women indeed underlined their socialist identity in quite firm terms. The Marxist idea was that the emancipation of women was possible only within a socialist system achieved through a revolutionary struggle by the working men and women. Thus, an organization that advanced women's interests and challenged male supremacy was seen by many Marxists as undermining the unity of the working class. Uh, in Russia, for example, the Social Democratic Labour Party and later the Bolsheviks were hostile to bourgeois feminists. And so were most socialists, both men and women around the world within the international socialist movement, including Kolontai and Zetkin. 
In a speech in 1913, Kalantai, for example, claimed that bourgeois feminists simply sought, quote, to achieve the same advantages, the same power, the same rights within capitalist society as those possessed now by their husbands, fathers, and brothers. The 1920s conference's thesis were in line with this reasoning. They stated that, quote, demands of the bourgeois women's movement have shown themselves to be incapable of assuring full rights and humanity for all women, as this aim merely at reforming the capitalist order for the benefit of the wives and daughters of the property classes, unquote. So uh, basically, um, bourgeois feminists ignored the interests of proletarian women. One of the feminist demands that communist source complex, at least for a certain period of time, was that of women's suffrage. Revolutionary Marxists in the, social, in the Second International, although they unconditionally supported universal suffrage uh, from the International's founding in 1889, nevertheless opposed the reforms that would extend voting rights only to privileged women, given the property requirements associated with the right to vote that denied vote to both men and women of lower social layers. They also did not view suffrage as a cure-all that would complete women's emancipation. Kolontai pointed out that for proletarian women, equal rights was merely a means to be used in the continuing struggle against the economic enslavement of the working class. Beginning in 1917, communist women, however, advocated suffrage for women in more unequivocal terms. Even though voting rights for women voting right for women was described as a chewed up bone given to women by bourgeois Democrats, the manifesto nonetheless urged women in capitalist countries that, quote, the right to vote should be used to organize, unite, and gather the forces of working women in order to achieve common goals. Uh, so the decision to support voting right for women um, appears to have been taken by 1920 by all of the women's sections of national communist parties. In practical terms, communist support for universal suffrage implied cooperation with non-proletarian women's movement, at least on this one issue. In fact, the idea of possible joint actions with feminists would be discussed many more times by communist women and the attitude to it would continue to be somewhat contradictory. Now let me go to my third point, which is the, um, the way uh, communist women viewed uh, motherhood and reproductive rights questions. Um, so a theoretical framework for communist ideas on reproduction and motherhood was first defined by the German socialist August Webel in his influential book, uh, Women Under Socialism. Uh, and this work inspired Alexandra Kolontai, who in 1916 wrote a six-page Society and Motherhood. Kolontai's book saw childbearing as a social responsibility to be shared between the family and society. Communist women, following the Soviet example, where 1918 decrees legally protected motherhood and established socialized childcare, integrated this idea into the first conference's thesis. So, uh, the state was to, quote, facilitate a harmonious combination of motherhood with employment, which must enable women by fully applying their strengths and capacities to develop fully their female humanity through setting up, of, uh, setting up welfare institutions. Um, maternal tasks were further defined as a social contribution, which in capitalist countries would require the, de the demand for, quote, the drastic reduction of capitalist exploitative power through effective legal protection of women workers, office employers, civil servants, and so-called domestics in all areas of the economy. And with due consideration for measures required by young and pregnant women, women with newborns and nursing, nursing mothers. Um, so communist women uh, demanded measures to protect motherhood, but they also tackled the question of reproductive rights. 
given the demographic context of the post-World War I era and the fact that the birth control was then advocated by many as means for population control and eugenics, communist women resisted attempts to uh, stigmatize women for having either too few or too many children. Clara Zetkin, for example, wavered on contraception in 1913, fearing it would be used to limit women's right to bear children. But later that year, she supported the family's reproduction rights. So um, to sum it up, uh, communist women saw abortion as necessary so long as society was unable to guarantee the material means for a prosperous childhood for all. This did not prevent them from denouncing the dreadful toll of illegal abortions and protesting against anti-abortion laws. Uh, and communist women did that in many countries, in France, even in fascist Italy, in Denmark, in Norway, in Canada, and in Germany. These in initiatives often had grass a grassroots character. Moreover, different currents within the women's rights movements joined these campaigns. Uh, this campaigns protesting anti-abortion laws, um, including bourgeois feminists. So on the ground, uh, communist women cooperated with uh, what they call bourgeois feminists. Uh, so now let me go to the point on, the, on housekeeping. Uh, one of the important points uh, raised at the conference, at the first conference, was the transformation of housekeeping uh, into a social industry. Kolotai wrote in this connection in 1920, the individual household is dying. It is giving way in our society to collective housekeeping. Instead of working woman uh, cleaning her flat, the communist society can arrange for men and women whose job it is to go around in the morning cleaning rooms. So the idea itself was not very new. It was already um, expressed by Engels uh, in his Origin of a Family, and then later by uh, Auguste Bebel. It was, however, the first time that the issue of housekeeping and labor division appeared as a crucial point of a socially, uh, socialist program for women's liberation. It was not present, for example, in the Second International's um, program. And in the nascent Soviet state, housework, which was usually traditionally done by women, was recognized as major means of her subordination. And the idea of creation of public amenities offering different kinds of services seemed to be taken seriously, even though their funding often represented a challenge. For women in capitalist and pre-capitalist countries, the thesis suggested striving for establishment of such institutions. In this way, the communist program put the women's question at the very center of the socialist project, underlining that women's emancipation was not only the consequence, but the very goal of socialist transformation. Um, uh, so again, so this, this was uh, the theoretical framework, but all these questions were um, debated many more times in, um, uh, in conferences. Um, okay, now let, let me go to, the, um, to my last, last point and speak a, li uh, a little bit about um, the work uh, among the women of the East. Uh, and I believe Anne would have a lot to say about that, about the work done by the Genodel um, in the Soviet Union. I would speak more about the uh, transnational uh, aspect of it, the international work that was done. So uh, the second conference, which was held in the summer of 21, was probably the liveliest event in the history of the movement. And one of the questions uh, discussed at the second conference um, was the work among the women of the East. The conference actually had more delegates from Eastern countries who prepared more detailed area reports and urged the elaboration of a more comprehensive position on approaching Eastern women. Um, Kalantai spoke in this connection 
uh, of the need to, uh, quote, have no fear of transitory methods of work in order to win the sympathy of these women and the need to rely on the experience and ideas of grassroots scatters from Eastern regions. Flexibility was in fact the strategy promoted by Soviet communists at the conference held in April 21 of women organizers from Eastern regions of the Soviet Russia. And this was also the strategy that um, the Genodel used. Uh, they understood that they had to take into consideration specific challenges presented by work among women from Eastern regions, in particular uh, Muslim women. One of the delegates at the second international conference urged the calling of a conference of women of the East, similar to the Baku Congress, organized by the Comintern a year later in 1919, at which peoples of, uh, no, 20, sorry, at which peoples of the East were, in the delegates' words, represented by men. So um, this idea was uh, realized in December 21, when communist women called the Tiflis, Tiflis is today's Belisi in Georgia, the Tiflis Conference of Eastern Women. So discussions at this conference were similar to the ones in the Genodil, concerning the way to approach women in Soviet republics of Central Asia. In the early 20s, the Genodel put accent on the voluntary participation of Central Asian women in social and economic women-only activities, on grassroots initiatives, and the necessity of moving slowly, taking into consideration local specificities. Again, uh, Anne would have uh, much more to say about this. Uh, so uh, what I want to say is that the international communist women shared this approach, uh, and it found its way into a resolution at the second international conference. Um, so it was a special re resolution on work among women of the East, uh, which said, uh, the sections or commissions must strictly avoid tactless, inappropriate or rude attacks on religious beliefs or national traditions while still resisting the influence of nationalism and religion. Initiatives of the Genodel included educational work and the organization of women's social and economic institutions for and by indigenous women. Similar methods of work would be used by the communist women internationally. Like the Genodel, which had a department for work with women of the East, the, communist, the international uh, communist women's movement established in 1921 the Women's Secretariat for the Near East, which was to coordinate work in Western Asia and Turkey. And it is, it's this secretariat that organized this conference in uh, Tiflis uh, in December uh, 21, with delegates from Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Kabardia, the Mountain Republic, Dagestan, as well as Turkey and Iran. And again, uh, as I said, the policy on women of the East was that of flexibility and sensitivity towards the conditions of life and cultural contexts that women of the East had to face. Um, so uh, I think I'm running out of time. So I'm trying to um, just to say a few things, a few important things. Um, so yeah, one of the aspects of this uh, sort of flexible approach was the fact that um, communist women um, suggested to uh, approach uh, women of uh, different social layers, um, not just working women, but also uh, intelligentsia, um, uh, <coughs> housewives, uh, peasants. Um, communist women were also aware of the fact that the liberation of women in the East was ultimately impossible without a change of attitude of men uh, towards the issue. Uh, the thesis worked out by the first international conference unambiguously pointed to the complexity in countries at a pre-capitalist pre uh, level of um, development. Uh, to fight to over, uh, quote to fight to overcome overcome the prejudices, morals, customs, 
and religious and legal regulations that reduce women to slaves of men at home, at work, and sexually. This effort will require the education not only of women, but also of men. Uh, at the Tiflis conference, it was argued that despite the legal freedom and equality obtained by women in Soviet republics, uh, in the Caucasus uh, in particular, in reality, quote, due to prejudices and holdovers in custom and social organization, they still remain enslaved. Uh, reports presented at the conference emphasize that such attitudes characterize not only men at large, but also male party activists in the East. And I would add to this, but I would not go into this topic today, that such attitudes were characteristic of uh, Western male communists as well, both on the leadership and rank and file level. Uh, now, let me just conclude saying that um, although the communist women's movement evolved significantly between 1920 and 1935, uh, 1935 is uh, the time when it actually ceased to exist. Uh, its earlier policies, many of which were in the vanguard and truly internationalist, still inspire, so can inspire today's women's rights militants, which in itself is the graphic proof of their relevance. The movement, despite sh some shortcomings, marked a historical advance, particularly regarding the interaction of women's liberation and socialist transformation. The international network of communist women was a team strongly committed to carrying out the collective decisions. They fought for a number of specific issues and demands that were directed exclusively at women around the world. And communist women saw them uh, as a goal, as the very goal rather than a consequence of socialist transformation of societies. So how is uh, just a few words on the relevancy and the legacy of the movement. Uh, so looking back at the communist women's movement a century later, one can see that the movement and the issues it championed foreshadow the rise of a mass movement for women's liberation throughout the world in the latter part of the 20th century, the so-called second wave feminism. Clearly, there have been changes in the situation facing women from what they were a century ago. At the same time, prospects for mass struggles for women's liberation are greater at present. This potential is largely the result of the massive influx of women throughout the world into the workforce and into the working class. But despite many women's fighters' victories, the fact of women's second-class status remains and many gains are under sharp attack. So many more fights are yet to come. And that's why the legacy of the communist women's movements remains relevant. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daria. I think especially um, in the lockdown, I think um, the fact that women's uh, second class citizen has become quite clear. A lot of women are losing their jobs now because they have to make a choice between uh, family and work. And it's been extremely difficult. And I speak from my own experience. Okay, I'm bringing in. I had the same. Have I, you? It's horrible. I have a young child to take care of. So, five-year-old child. So. Okay. Last word. Anne McShane is going to look a bit closer at the women of the East. Hello. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Tina and comrades in the Labour Left Alliance. And thank you, Daria. It's my first time meeting Daria today. And um, I very much welcome the work that herself and John Riddell and Mike Tabor have been doing in basically bringing to light this uh, important organisation. Um, I, I believe myself that it is really important for us. Uh, as communists and as socialists and as progressives to be aware of this history. And it's a great shame that really, like so much of us, it hasn't been available to us until very recently. Um, we know a lot about the main figures of the Russian Revolution, you know, particularly, obviously, the men. We, we know very little about the women's movement. Um, and for myself, the reason that I actually went away and studied this question was because I had so many unanswered questions 
Um, I've been involved in the communist movement in Britain for 20 years and obviously had been, well, I, not obviously, but I had been very active. Um, and I'd always asked, you know, what was the reality of the women's movement in the Soviet Union? And really, I hadn't been satisfied with the answers. Um, mostly what was said was that uh, formal um, gains had been made in legislative terms following the revolution, but very little had actually happened in practical terms. And I was glad to find when I eventually did go away and research it, learn Russian and went away and, and read the journal that I based my study on, was that actually very much had been done. Um, and uh, very much of it is, it's very important to us today. So to me, when I started to read Kommunistka, which is the journal of the Genotia, which was the women's department or women's bureau of the uh, communist a party of the Soviet Union, it was really like finding buried treasure. Um, and I was enormously glad uh, to see um, the kind of ideas and the um, sort of work that they pioneered. So, okay, so the Genot Gel um, was set up in 1919 following a, a conference of uh, working class women and peasant women that took place in Moscow. Uh, the November before then. Um, basically, uh, the core idea behind the Genot Gel was to develop uh, the emancipation of women within the socialist project. Uh, there had obviously been work done by many of the Bolshevik women uh, during 1917 and before then, but there was a lot of dissatisfaction that uh, more wasn't been done by the Soviet state and that women were continued to be, um, although they were working, um, were, were, were living very oppressed lives. Um, so basically, as Daria has said, uh, the object was to put the woman's question at the core of the struggle for socialism. And basically, something that was repeated a lot by Genotial members was that you cannot have socialism without women's emancipation, that it wasn't something that could be put off for further down the line. It was something that had to be addressed in the here and now. So my work um, has been on the Soviet East and the work of the Genotiel, particularly in Uzbekistan. So I just want to, I suppose I've kind of what I've done is I've looked at it for tonight in various stages of, de of development and partly that allows us to see, I suppose, the progress of the 1920s and the kind of political changes that took place in that period of time. So the work in the East began from 1920 onwards, uh, following the uh, end of the Civil War and Colin Tai, who had taken over from Inessa Armand as the director of the Genotiel, following our man's uh, untimely death in October 1920, Colin Tice spearheaded the work to the east. And basically, uh, in a, in a, in, I suppose the approach was set out in an article that she wrote in 1920 called The Last Slave. And the, 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 the approach was uh, based on the hope that the women of the east would rise up uh, to welcome the revolution into their lives and that basically they would make their own revolution against their ruling classes in the East and for their own liberation as women. Um, now, and that did happen a little bit um, and there were, or, there was organisations sprung up in 1920, 1921 in uh, preparation for a conference that was due to take place in Moscow in uh, 1921. And this conference was to be a non-party conference of working class and peasant women of the East. Unfortunately, that conference was cancelled um, because it was said that it couldn't take place because of essentially uh, logistical problems, difficulties at the time um, with food and other issues. Um, being able to be provided to conference attendees. So the conference never happened. And uh, in fact, actually, um, I think when Dari was talking about the conference, the women, the Commerce Women's Conference 
uh, their, their conference in 1921, a number of the women who turned up and went on stage and unveiled, uh, because they were women, veiled women, at that conference had actually been going to Moscow for their own conference, Women of the East, and actually ended up at this international event, which has still gone ahead. So anyway, um, the, the, this, this international, sorry, the women's, the Conference of Women of the East didn't happen, but a, an activist conference did take place that April, and it was addressed by Colin Tai. And similar to the way in which Daria has described the attitude of the communist women's uh, movement towards uh, Muslim women and women of the East, the approach of Colin Tai and those who voted through the thesis that she presented was mirrored that flexible attitude. Um, so the, the main uh, organizational form of the Genotel in Russia and in the kind of more Western parts of the um, Soviet Union was called uh, delegate meetings. And these were meetings that were set up in districts and in factories where women would vote through their policies and then they would be kind of seconded into various departments or factories in order to learn skills and come back and educate others. It was a very kind of a flexible form of organization itself. Well, anyway, it was, it was decided that this wasn't going to do in the East because women, especially in Uzbekistan and um, Azerbaijan, um, they had, those women were uh, secluded. Um, they weren't allowed to mix with men outside their own family and they were veiled. So the agreement was that they would set up a, a form known as clubs. And these clubs were sort of like hubs where basically um, they would have, uh, there would be cooperatives within the clubs where women would be, you know, doing handicraft work. Um, there would be um, uh, educational classes. There would be uh, medical consultations. There would be a theater group, choir. And, and within that, then there would be um, the provision of childcare for the women that attended. The, um, the club that was the kind of the one that they were all to kind of put forward to copy was one based in Baku uh, called the Ali Bayramova Club. Um, so after 21, there really wasn't very much happened. Colin Tai was removed from her, her position as the director of the Genotel. Um, in the uh, aftermath of the workers' opposition fight, because she had been one of the leading people um, in that. And um, so there was a year or two where very little happened. And then in 1923, there was a relaunch of work in the East, and the woman who was in charge of that work in Central Asia was a woman called Serafima Lubimova, who had been a supporter and a follower of Colin Tice. Um, so uh, the the work, the agreement on the kind of work that they were going to carry out um, was confirmed. This is the right way to approach everything, and basically they um, started to set up these clubs. Now they had a lot of difficulty, um, particularly um, at the very beginning, um, because it was hard to attract women to these clubs because they seemed so kind of at odds with the life before then. Um, and also there wasn't much support coming either from the leadership of the Communist Party in Moscow, which gave formal support, but no practical support. And also from communist men on the ground, a point that Dari has already made. Um, there were practical difficulties for uh, the women involved in them in terms of um, the, the cooperatives because they couldn't go to the markets to sell the goods that they produced because of the difficulties of being secluded. So the aim of the clubs in terms of trying to um, provide women with some economic independence was very difficult, they were very difficult aims to realize. Um, so um, nevertheless, uh, the first club in Central Asia was set up in 1925 um, and they had 500 members and various figures are given uh, for like of 71,000 women and their children attending medical consultations in clubs within six months in, in 1926. 
and that by 1926 also there were 34 clubs. So a small number of, of organisations, some had their own premises, 34 of them apparently had their own premises, and then they would have red corners in general clubs. So um, then a, a, a positive turning point came for the Genogel after 1924. So 1924, uh, saw, as people will know, the national delimitation program in Central Asia and the creation of republics, the stands as we know them today, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Kazakh Kazakhstan. And, and in Uzbekistan, which is where I studied, um, the, uh, the Muslim intelligentsia, the Jadid movement, which was a modern uh, uh, Muslim movement was involved in the government, in the government of the Republic. And this was as part of the Kornizatsi program, which was to involve you know, national groupings in the government. This involvement was reflected uh, among Muslim women who were part of the Jadid movement, and they became involved in the Genogel for really for the first time. Uh, an organ, uh, the, the Genocide launched an Uzbek uh, women's journal called Yangi Yol, which is a new life. And um, basically, uh, women, I would say, indigenous women came flooding into the Genocide in this period. Um, what, what, what happened, the initiative, which I think was the most successful initiative, um, at that time was the creation of women only shops and these were set up in all of the various cities in, in, in Uzbekistan and some of the uh, bigger towns. Um, so basically uh, these shops, I just want to say a few words about them to tell you what they were, how they functioned and why they were good, why they were very useful. Um, firstly they were part of the co general cooperative movement um, they were consumer cooperatives, which meant that women could go there um, and buy whatever they needed. They could go into the shop and unveil. They could pick out what they wanted themselves, which was something they weren't able to do in the markets um, where, where they would be among men. Um, they were able to bring their own produce there and sell it. Um, and then the Uzbek, uh, the, the assistants were either Uzbek or they could speak Uzbek. Um, they, they were able to um, also take part in various discussions and debates. There would be readings of the journal, there would be mother and baby corners. Um, there would be various different activities going on within the shop. So they became more than just a shop, they became like a social centre for women who went there to do their shopping or to sell their goods, or even, you know, for meetings. The good thing about the shops was also that they were not out of sync with the kind of, I suppose, the, the, the culture of the local population and that men didn't mind, local men, indigenous men didn't mind women going to these shops because they were relieved of the burden of shopping themselves and they just didn't seem anything at odds with them. It didn't, wasn't a problem um, in the same way that going to the clubs was. And then bigger cooperative organisations began to go up around them. So what I think is important about them, and I've just given you a brief description, is just that to show that they were a way of, of veiled women uh, entering into kind of social life in a safe way and being able to attain some sort of um, economic independence and become political. Um, and all in a way that didn't jar with the uh, over, over uh, arching culture uh, of Central Asia. So, um, okay, moving along, I know I'm taking more time than I should. Um, okay, so basically, um, up to 1926, the Central Committee uh, was not really involved in any way in what was going on in Central Asia. Um, mostly, they were, you know, the general gel there was ignored. But in 1926, a change came about. At that time, as people will know, Stalin managed to uh, wrest control of the Central Committee and moves began to be put in place for a very different form of 
uh, I suppose, politics, social control than it had existed before then. And in 1926, the Central Committee sent a, a, a direction to the Central Asian Bureau that they were to put in place uh, policies in order to deal with the Islamic clergy in the East. And basically, what was decided upon was that they would launch what was called a hujum, um, which means attack in Uzbek or Nastuplenia, the, the Russian word for the same thing. So basically, this was an attack on what they called the roots of reaction within Central Asian society. And what it was to do was, it was to use women, indigenous women, in order to, I suppose, um, in order to use them to rebel against the old society and cause like a firestorm and basically the, 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 the Central Asian Bureau and behind them the Central Committee hoped to destroy the hold of Islam over that society. So basically that announcement was made and the um, Genotjel, the Russian women in the Genotjel were really not happy about it at all. Uh, Lubimova uh, you know, said, well, basically, it's going to cause uh, enormous problems. Women won't be safe anymore. Our various initiatives will be destroyed. Um, the uh, indigenous women were very positive, uh, actually, uh, about the Hudjum to begin with, because for them, they had connected their liberation with Soviet policy and also because the Jadid movement itself um, was based on the women that was based in Tartaristan and were, they were generally against veiling and covering. Anyway, so in late 1926, there were meetings held in Uzbekistan of uh, communist men and their families. And these men were told that they had to unveil their wives and sisters and mothers um, all uh, on the March the 8th, 1927. So March the 8th, 1927, there were the de demonstrations in cities all over Uzbekistan. Uh, an estimated 90,000 women marched uh, in, and in very dramatic scenes tore off the Paranji, which was the was the long veil and the chakfon, which was the facial veil, and burned them in pyres. Um, and the news was reported in journals throughout the Soviet Union. Um, this, this was a massive blow for women's emancipation. But actually, the opposite was true. The women that unveiled that day were very soon back under the veil, because what the Hujum did was that it provoked a firestorm of reaction against women. The local populations, led by the mullahs, um, launched war basically on women who were uh, involved in any way in public life. Um, and while there was a second unveiling on, on 1st of May, that too was attacked. And essentially, by all reports, 90% or more of the women who unveiled, reveiled. Uh, very soon afterwards. So basically, uh, many women were murdered. I mean, you can read the reports and there are many academics who write about this hujum and what it meant uh, for women in, um, in Central Asia. So um, just to move on now to the aftermath of this hujum. Um, Komuniska, um, as I've already said, the Genotel were not keen on the, the Hujum. The Komuniska barely mentioned it. The Lubimova and others carried on writing about the shops and the clubs and the various other initiatives they were involved in. Um, and then uh, the only mention was when they were taken to task by a leading member of the, of the um, Central Asian Bureau, basically condemning them for not protecting unveiled women, blaming them for the events that happened after the, um, the attack on the, on the women who had unveiled. Um, in 1928, uh, very interestingly, in 1928, there was a debate uh, for six months of that year in the pages of Komuniska. And Nadezhda Krupskaya, um, who was the editor of that journal, launched and led that debate and it led up to a conference of women in the east in 
December 1928. So this is obviously a time where, you know, the um, the first five-year plan has been announced in late 1927. The situation has become very dangerous to speak out, and I personally think it was a very brave stance that Nadia Nadia Zhukovskar made that year. And um, during the course of the debate, uh, a number of points were made by the uh, activists in the Genot Gel, the communist women in the Genot Gel. Firstly, that the Hujum had been a failure. The communist men had either turned on their wives and daughters and forced them to unveil or punished them for, for doing so and, and taken part in some of the killings and attacks on women. The second thing was that the clubs had all collapsed because women couldn't go out anymore. Even Russian genital women couldn't go out anymore. It was too dangerous. The third thing was that the women-only shops had been closed down without notifying the genital by the general cooperative movement, basically saying there's no need for women-only shops anymore because women have unveiled, which obviously the opposite was true, and they had gone. Um, there were criticisms of local communist party members and there were calls for autonomy, autonomous organisation, um, uh, apart from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, um, because it was seen that communist men actually, in many respects, were worse than other men, other indigenous men. Um, so, you know, they were more tied to, tr to tradition and more obstinate and less concerned. At the conference itself, and Nadezhda Krupskaya spoke out about the, against, basically, against the, um, the anti-religious commission, which had been formed at that time, uh, spoke out about the attempts to impose a dead level on society and argued against banning of religious ceremonies, etc. So she basically spoke out from the perspective of opposition to what Stalin was doing at the time. Um, however, um, I, that was her last time speaking in such a manner. Um, the conference had been attended also, as becomes apparent when you read Communist Care in 1929, it had been attended by leading uh, communist uh, central committee members who supported Stalin, including Yaroslavsky, who led the anti-religious commission, the League of the Militant Godless. Um, the Genot Gel were told in the aftermath of the conference that they had to continue to support unveiling as part of bringing uh, indigenous women into the um, uh, five-year plan. So basically, from that time onwards until the Genot Gel was closed down in March 1930, it really became, it was like there's no debate on the paper and the journal. It's basically all about loyally supporting the five-year plan. It's all about uh, unveiling women so that they can go and work in factories and in collective farms. Um, and there's no agency, you know, either from the point of view of the genotiel or from the women themselves. In fact, it was just a recruiting sergeant for the five-year plan. And then in 1930, um, it was announced that they basically there was no more need for the genotel. The women's question had been solved. In future, the party would deal with it, which obviously meant it wasn't going to be dealt with. Um, and um, the, uh, the organisation was no more. So just to conclude, so from my point of view, I believe that the genotel is very important for us to learn about precisely because it tried to marry the, the um, struggle for socialism and under workers, un, and under workers control with the, with the struggle for women's emancipation. And it took many uh, very interesting initiatives, um, which I can't go into here, but you know, in Russia, as opposed to Central Asia, but it was all about women's self-emancipation. The role of the Central Committee under Stalin was obviously the direct opposite. They manipulated the very real aspirations of indigenous women for liberation in order to use that to, to attack their society. I mean, the question of women's rights was not of their concern at all. Um, Central Asia where it was obviously, as people will know, uh, one of the parts of the Soviet Union that was hit really hard during the uh, first five-year plan. Um, 
society was, you know, really uh, under attack um, and there, were, there was famine, there was great suffering. And I believe the Hujum was a softening up of Central Asia for the five year plan. So I suppose the contrast, you can see the clear contrast between the approach of the Jeanne Hotel and the approach of Stalin and the Central Committee in 1927 and 1928. You can see from this experience that something very real had changed um, in Russia and the Soviet Union and that, for me, a period of reaction had begun. Anyway, thank you very much and sorry for talking for so long. Thanks. No worries at all. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions from the floor. I'm just going to make comments into panelists. Um, but I want to abuse my position as chair to also ask a few questions, and make a few comments. I think it's very fascinating, both both comrades, and it is not something um, I or I believe most most comrades know a lot about. So it's very important to educate ourselves um, as, about our history and this part of our history. Um, and then a, a few questions, really. I think, um, well, first of all, I think it's um, the struggle of women in in that period and in, in 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 the in in Russia and in that area really, I think underlines the not just double I guess it's a triple oppression I guess of women in in those societies uh, must have been absolutely massive from especially from what what Anne has been describing um, tiny working class in that area you know mo hugely dominated by peasantry etc and it, I think it really underlines the um, impossibility of trying to get to even something close to socialism in such a backward country and the the uh, the idea that you know when lenin when lenin was saying we can't really make revolution in in russia without without the germans helping out and we've looked at the the failure of the german revolution in a in a previous webinar but i think this 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 uh, your descriptions really under underline the possibility or uh, the, the, the need for revolution to be international, especially if, if it starts in such a backward country like Russia, it, it almost couldn't succeed uh, in, in terms of, you know, really achieving any kind of uh, equality or emancipation of women or let alone, you know, men, of course, as well, men weren't emancipated in, in Russia in that sense either. But uh, that that really hammered that one that one home. How how difficult a position the, the the Russians were in, the Bolsheviks were in. Once there was a revolutionary movement, but you know they were very aware of the limitations and the problems um, uh, they faced as such a backward country. Um, I wonder, um, um, Daria was talking about some of the um, demands of the women's movement, and I wonder if you could talk about them a little bit more when you when you come back. Uh, because we do, you know, it, it, it is quite important, I think, to to think beyond about what what we today think as, you know, sort of women's women's uh, demands for 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 emancipation, etc. You know, equal wages, etc. These are all quite, you know, we we're trying to catch up, and we in bourgeois democracy really. And, and as I mentioned earlier in the lockdown, it's it's going back again, so we be, have to be catching up a lot more. But I think under you know, in a sort of a, the, the Marxists and communists when they were when they were um, developing ideas, you know, and the ideas of sort of collective housekeeping. I mean, that's quite, that's really interesting to me. What kind of different, uh, you know, new ideas comrades had at the time and were exploring at the time in, in the international women's movement. Um, you do mention, you know, Clara Zetkin was a bit wavering on reproduct reproductive rights for for a while. And that she then came around to to fighting for the right to abortion, uh, as long as women weren't guaranteed the right to live prosperously. So I guess the sort of the choice that wasn't really an issue at the at the time was it sort of my body, my choice. You know that that even if I'm rich, I can still de decide not to want to have children. Was that something that wasn't really even considered at the time? That would would interest me. That kind of thing. Um, and also the the question of um, it's my last point really the question of winning over man is of course the key question uh, unless men fight for women's liberation you know it's it's going to be very difficult also for 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 men unless men fight for the you know the emancipation of women men will never be free it's that that old Marxist saying um, but I wonder what what both of the speakers' attitude are uh, in terms of um, women's 
separate organization, um, which is kind of a subject that that has at the moment is is uh, we're engaged in in a, in a slightly different way. It's the the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and the setting up of uh, BAME groups, BAME black groups, etc., which are obviously they are there's a huge need for these for these comrades to get together or these these members to get together to to work out their their demands and their platform and what they're struggling for and what they're suffering from etc but i see a certain a problem developing perhaps for example in the black lives matter in in many groups white people aren't allowed to speak on platforms they're not allowed to get involved they're not allowed to learn i think from much of these struggles and uh, I wonder if there's, you know, if we, if we know that the, the issue of, you know, we have to win over men as, uh, in the women's movement, how can we do that if we separate ourselves off in, a, in different sections? Was that an issue at the time? Or is that something that, you know, in, 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 it's just I can, I can, I can talk about because I'm in, in modern society, you know, that's, that's an issue we can, we can talk about. And do you see that as a problem or not? I, I am struggling to get my head around it, I have to say. Um, I've seen lots of women section being set up and disintegrating or splitting from organizations on the left. That happens quite a lot. Same with black sections or BAME sections, etc. There is a sort of tendency, you know, you, the, 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 the sort of division between self-emancipation, you need to organize together and splitting off and not actually educating the people you have to educate. How do we solve that that problem? Um, if you have any any clever remarks on that question, I would appreciate them. Okay, I'm bringing in uh, Ken first from the uh, uh, audience. Hello, Ken. Hello, good evening, and my th thanks to Daria and Jan for a very informative webinar. Certainly, it's not a subject I'd have to confess I know a great deal about. Um, Questions to, to Daria, really, in the, the first instance. Daria mentioned that there was some involvement of the international women's movement in fascist Italy. And I'm wondering how far they played any part in our resistance to Mussolini as he sort of rose to power in 1925. Um, the other part of Europe where I'd be interested in the extent to which, you know, influence went out from Russia is Spain. Now the Second Republic wasn't formed until 1931 and that's a, a little beyond the, the period that was covered by the, your talks. I just wondered how far any of the seeds for the Spanish Communist Women's Movement was, how far those seeds were sown in the, the 1920s from Russia. So I'd be uh, interested in any thoughts you might have on either of those countries. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And Alan, please. Okay. Um, well, this, I'd also like to thank the speakers. Um, I think this is a very important question, which um, resonates today as much as it did historically. Um, I'd also like to say, uh, thanks to Tina for taking time out for her birthday and happy birthday to Tina. Um, so I've got a question, um, not so much about the historical record, but to both speakers, to what extent do you um, see the experiences of the um, early communist work uh, around women's liberation in providing lessons for the organisations of the revolutionary left today? Um, I ask that because my experience um, is that there is quite a strong tendency on the left to relegate the struggle for women's liberation to after the revolution. So there's a tendency to only get involved in struggles around women's liberation, women's rights, when those struggles take on a mass nature. And so it's more in the just being attracted by the mass nature of it rather than the actual issue itself. And I, I would tend to see it rather as being something that should be a very tightly integrated part of the 
political program and political perspectives and political activity of any revolutionary communist organization. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Um, I've got no other speakers from the floor at the moment. If anybody wants to indicate, can you put it in the chat, please, or um, click raise hand? Otherwise, I bring Anne and Daria back first. Daria, would you like to reply to a few of those questions or comments, please? Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. Sorry, Daria, could you do the... Um, Headphones again. I think it's the the sound is just quite bad there. Thank you. So yeah. Uh, do Do you hear me now? Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. That's good. Yep. yep. Okay. Good. Okay. So let me uh, answer Tina's questions first. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if we speak about the demands of uh, communist women, uh, so yeah, well, of course, the ultimate goal was the revolution and the complete emancipation of women, um, which would mean the total equality in law and in practice, uh, equal sal uh, salaries, um, um, access to education, access to medical care, um, doing away with double standards for men and women, um, suffrage for women. Um, so basically, um, the demands that were uh, still quite revolutionary for the time, because say uh, even uh, suffrage for women was not uh, um, was not yet uh, adopted in uh, many capitalist countries. And then there were, of course, uh, many uh, immediate demands that concerned and targeted specifically, that directed, that were directed exclusively at women. Um, and I spoke about some of them. Uh, such as uh, protection of motherhood, like communists around the world asked for um, eight weeks uh, maternal leaves and uh, uh, social aid to unemployed mothers and actually quite, quite a list of uh, um, demands r related to motherhood that were also very uh, progressive for the time. Um, um, so then there was this question of uh, uh, separation of household duties, which was uh, also something, something quite new. Um, yeah, and of course, yeah, when we speak about the uh, protection of motherhood, then uh, the whole uh, and household duties, the whole question of uh, creating uh, public amenities that would um, help women to um, um, yeah the whole question of, of creating of uh, public amenities uh, comes up like um, child cares laundries and public um, kitchens and uh, lots of institutions of this kind which were very uh, which were set up in the Soviet Union in the early 20s and um, were a big help, although, of course, uh, um, their funding was often a problem. Um, so as to the question of uh, reproductive rights and motherhood as a choice, uh, I don't think Tsetkin really spoke about that. Um, I believe in, uh, geno in the Genodel there were uh, a lot of discussions about that probably and would know more about, uh, about these discussions. Um, yeah, I think it, it seems to me that uh, in general uh, Soviet women were sort of uh, uh, in the vanguard 
uh, of the movement uh, as far as uh, family relations and sexual norms and uh, um, including reproductive choice uh, as far as these issues were concerned. Um, from the documents I've seen for this research about the uh, about communist women in other countries, um, there isn't much that strikes as um, uh, very um, unusual, very uh, very innovative, so to speak, um, concerning this question of of uh, uh, reproductive choice. Um, yeah, so then <laughs> the, the huge question of um, men and women uh, within the communist uh, movement. Um, so what strikes one, um, what, what's, what was really striking for me when I first look at those doc looked at those documents of the communist women's movement is the fact that women are complaining all the time about men, uh, party men, not being supportive, not uh, being, but basically, not only they are not supportive, but they are basically often uh, antagonistic to uh, uh, women's activities. Uh, and well, on the one hand, there is the issue that uh, women's activism sort of calls into question uh, Marxist class-based analysis. Mm -hmm. And it is for this reason that many uh, social democratic and socialist parties, uh, uh, like pre-revolution, pre pre say, uh, social democratic and socialist parties around the world were sort of against uh, uh, women-only uh, organizations. And so was the uh, uh, so were the Bolsheviks actually up until uh, 1918 when uh, outstanding leaders like uh, Armand Polontai sort of uh, convinced <laughs> convinced them that such organizations were necessary. Um, so yeah, but then yeah, once you have this women's organization. Yeah, obviously this issue comes up that Tina spoke about that, yeah, actually if men are not there, how do you win them over and how do you explain um, uh, women's emancipation to them and, and make them contribute to it, right? Uh, basically what was happening in the communist women's movement uh, was that, um, so, Basically, it was organized a bit the same way as the Jeanne Del in the uh, in Soviet Russia. Uh, there were women's departments in communist parties, and actually, men could also belong to these departments, and they were encouraged to, mm -hmm. to join them. <laughs> but in reality, it never really happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this was probably the way to uh, integrate uh, mm -hmm. men into this struggle, but. Uh, it didn't really work uh, on the ground. Uh, yeah, another problem related to, um, to relationship be between men and women is just the simple uh, private sphere uh, male chauvinism, which was also there, you know. Um, one doesn't become a women's rights fighter overnight, right? Like if one looks, for example, even at Russia uh, where, uh, uh, bef be before uh, 1918 decrees, uh, men had the right to beat their wives, and like it's not it's not a decree that would change you know things uh, overnight. And even if one looks at uh, some writings of Lenin and Trotsky, big and enlightened uh, leaders, uh, some chauvinist remarks come up all the time. So, yeah, so the, 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 the and, and, that's, and that's why communist women spoke all the time about the fact that work should be done on women and with women and by women, but also on men. Uh, and um, what's quite impressive about the, this, the, the communist women's movement is that 
they were aware of difficulties, they spoke about them, but they continued to struggle, they never gave up, and they actually won many times. And they managed to bring forward their agenda and um, to convince uh, party men to participate more. Uh, and, uh, and, and also this, uh, this uh, sort of united them. And this made them uh, more um, effective, made their, their work more effective and more efficient probably. Um, they really worked as a, as a united and tightly knit uh, team. And even though there are, they had lots of uh, differences of opinion, uh, while discussing things, once they took decision, uh, they were following, uh, bringing it into life altogether, um, working together. So, um, so what do we do about it today? <laughs> that's, that's even a bigger question. <laughs> Um, how do we um, involve men into um, uh, issues related to oppression of women or to the emancipation of women? Uh, if we have women only organizations. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one. I don't know whether Anne would have a, <laughs> a solution on that. <laughs> how to find this middle ground to, to think about class uh, and gender. And then there is also race, ethnicity, and all mm. other factors of discrimination and oppression to be taken into consideration. How can we all work together and um, find uh, um, solutions? Mm. Um, so, okay, let me now go to Kenneth's questions. Uh, so, commerce women in fascist Italy. Well, to tell you the truth, um, I don't really know much about this particular uh, country, about how women were organized in this particular country. I looked more at the um, international movement. Um, uh, I know that communist women um, did organize and did lead actually campaigns um, against uh, anti-abortion laws in Italy, uh, but obviously uh, it was very, very difficult um, uh, given that Italy was fascist since 22. Um, Um, sticking about Italy, um, I also have to say that the uh, communist women's movement was really marginal, really small there. Um, actually, if one looks at the um, um, at figures and at how many women, at ratios, men and women in communist parties, um, uh, the uh, the largest percentages of women were in, um, say, uh, northern European countries like Germany and Scandinavia. Um, uh, as to uh, southern European countries like Italy, France, uh, Spain, uh, uh, women would represent probably one to three percent of uh, communist parties' leaderships. So uh, I think this fact also uh, made their work uh, in this country, in Italy specifically, uh, more difficult. Uh, as to Spain, um, Spain of the 30s, uh, well, I guess we all know stories about uh, communist women uh, participating actively during the Popular Front and during the Civil War. Uh, in Spain, but as I said, um, 
yeah, in in the twenties, the percentage of women in communist parties was also very low. Uh, and then Ellen's question, I think I didn't quite understand <laughs> what what exactly he was asking. I'm, I'm really sorry. I sort of, yeah, missed Most it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> if you could repeat, or maybe Anne could answer and then I can add. Um, if. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, and do you want to come back now? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. I thought that uh, Ken's questions were really interesting and I don't know the answer to those questions. But what I would say is that clearly there were women's sections set up at least in some of the communist parties, the majority of them, it seems to be, but we don't know much about them at all. Um, for instance, I don't know anything about the women's section in the CPGB, it, uh, the, the British uh, Communist Party. I know nothing about it at all. And I'm wondering, did they set one up? Um, I know that they did translate some documents that one, one um, edition of Communiska had articles translated in the main languages and a comrade of mine has told me he's found them in the Marx Memorial Library in, in London but I don't know what else, I know nothing about it and it's part of the reason why I think we really do need to do a lot more work to find out this is our movement, this is our communist women's movement we need to know about it um, and it's just there for us to go and look at um, so in terms of what tina was saying about separate organizations for women i would concur with what darius said the genotel was a committee for work among women it wasn't a it wasn't a committee for women only and Kominiska had articles from the very beginning from likes of Zinoviev, Pribozhensky um, and other, um, Sverdlov, others wrote in it. So it wasn't just for women. In fact, as Daria said, uh, they really wanted to convince men to become involved. They didn't want to have all the responsibility for organising among women. And in the East, it would have been really helpful for them if they had had more communist men support them because it would have been easier to get women involved rather than them having to try and find ways to get around communist men to involve women they would have had their participation and support so certainly they didn't want to be a separatist and the whole argument in fact they didn't even want to set up the general gel to begin with because they were very afraid of becoming and marginalized and in fact they did become marginalized eventually because they weren't you know there really wasn't the interest there so um so basically i think for me um just to like talk about like how about today i believe that we really as a movement haven't done enough study or enough theoretical consideration of the necessity for women's emancipation to be at the core of the struggle for socialism. Um, Daria mentioned Babel and Engels, and I agree with her, you know, their ideas, their um, was vision of the future put forward a very different kind of a vision for the family and for kind of socialization of domestic labor and childcare, and basically the collective collectivization or the collective approach to all human activities as opposed to domestic labour being private. Um, and Colin Tai was very, wrote a lot, was very actively arguing for the supersession of the family. But I think that the Bolsheviks, myself, did very little on this question. And I think that they just weren't convinced. They didn't see women's question as a priority. They didn't see it as integral to the struggle. 
And I've been criticised by comrades in the CPGB for being overly critical of the, uh, they've criticised me for being over, overly critical of the Bolsheviks for their lack of um, support for the Genotel. But I think it's important to make that criticism in order that we can learn from that and educate ourselves because like, if we don't have the women's question at the core of our struggle for socialism, then it's like, well, what kind of socialism is it? It's not a universal project. It's a project that just, is, just says, well, these are the issues that we need to focus on, um, which mainly you know, involve men being in the leadership of organizations and leading it, and leaving out this whole, these, these like such important questions of the role of the family, and not involving women, and um, not involving women in the struggle at every level, not making it a collective, universal uh, struggle. So I think, for me, I think that that's the issue that we really need to be going back and looking at the ideas of Engels and, and Babel and like building on those ideas, developing our theory and education must be key um, to that, which is something which uh, Nadezhda Krupskaya argued, we need to educate men so that they understand why it is so important to their own liberation for them to support women's emancipation. So that, that would be, that would be um, my view on it. And I think that like, it's so important that as part of that, that we get to know our history and don't see ourselves as, you know, like feminists. I don't see myself as a feminist. I see myself as somebody who's a communist, who's got a particular interest in women's liberation in those in that history and those struggles. But I think that feminism doesn't add anything to that. I think that feminism makes it look as though it's like you've got to have socialist feminism or Marxist feminism or, you know, that you've, you know, that it's a separate sectional struggle and must be a universal struggle. And that is what the Genotiel and the communist women's movement, that's what they were trying to do. That's my views. Thank you. Thank you very much, comrades. Um, I've got no other um, comrades indicating, so I think we will just bring this to a, a slightly earlier uh, end this session. I think there were a few technical problems in the registration, etc., and the advertised starting time. Sorry, it's a uh, lockdown is clearly not good for my brain. It's a uh, it's a it's a bit of a struggle. Um, so thank you very much for joining us all. I think we can agree that we all have to learn a lot, well, not the two speakers, but certainly us in the audience, we have to learn a lot about this issue. And this, this uh, session has certainly been a, a great start to that. Thank you very much to all the people in the audience and to our two speakers. And I hope you have a good evening. Thank, thank you. you. Tina. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Daria. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Daria. Thanks so much. <laughs> be in touch. Yeah, let's be in touch. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay. okay.